Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I have a very cool guest today. His name is John Dankinich. And John sold Cutco shortly after high school. Uh, he became an assistant manager in his second summer, uh, worked primarily with Mike Muriel uh, when Mike was a new division manager with the company. Uh, John graduated from Purdue University in 2001. He went to Purdue for grad school as well, uh, graduated again in 2003, and uh, got into being a rocket scientist. He is now the chief technologist for the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, we have got a lot of interesting things to talk about today. John, I'm really grateful you've taken the time to be with our audience and share your experiences and insights. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Dan. It's an honor to be here. Fantastic. Well, why don't you start by helping our audience get to know a little bit about you, a little bit about your personal background at first? Uh, sure, thanks. Yeah, so um, as, as you mentioned, you know, for several years now, I've been the chief technologist at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, which is down in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, I recently became the in-space transportation capability lead for the agency. Uh, my career has always been centered around advanced propulsion systems, uh, some mission design, and also some technology development. I'm married with two kids, uh, Jonah and Josie, uh, live in Alabama, and just uh, have been blessed with the life that I have. So um, I don't know how far you want me to go back, uh, but I was born in East Chicago, Indiana, uh, but really grew up in Hammond. Uh, sometimes I, I even joke, uh, for every great city, there's a depressed region just downwind. You know, so as a kid, uh, um, I used to go with my dad to a big open, super fun site and launch rockets. Um, but it's all the region, you know, the Calumet region of Northwest Indiana. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's where I went to, uh, to Gavit for high school. Uh, but my career path that I mapped out uh, really started much earlier. Uh, in the third grade, I believe, uh, I wrote my mom a letter on that, uh, that one inch uh, ruled brown paper. And I, and I told her that I was going to be an aerospace engineer and, and specifically that I was going to go to the Air Force Academy. You know, that was my plan. And, and I stayed focused on that goal for, you know, the next nine years. You know, my, my wrestling coach helped me train for the physical fitness test. I even took the ACC twice to get a 36 because I, I didn't want to risk anything. You know, it was an exciting time when I did receive my appointment to the academy and everything was set. It was a big relief, you know, you get when you finally earn something, you work so hard. And, uh, and I didn't have to stress out about the cost of college. I didn't even have to stress out about what I was going to wear for the next several years. Um, I received this huge trophy that's still in my mom's basement, you know, free college, an opportunity to serve my country, and I was going to be an aerospace engineer like I wanted. Um, but neither of my parents went to college. Uh, my father served in Vietnam, and then he worked in a steel mill until he died of cancer, um, which was before I graduated high school. Uh, my mom was a beautician doing hair, cleaning doctor's offices, the hair salon, and really anything she could do to make money. And so I'm very blessed to have parents that gave everything they had for me to be successful. Unfortunately, uh, things fell apart briefly. Um, it was literally the day before I was flying out to basic training, and I had my airplane ticket, my military boots, and it was actually going to be my first time on an airplane when the academy called me and said that I had a problem with my heart uh, from my medical exam. I had failed the EKG, and, uh, and I couldn't board my flight the next day. Uh, you know, it, it had been already at that time over a month since I drove to Notre Dame for my exam, and so it was kind of a major shock. Um, that, that phone call is actually um, still a vivid memory that I have 25 years later, even though you know, I think my mom took it a lot worse than I did. Um, so for the, the start of the summer, um, you know, I needed to pivot and find a, find a new path you know, really for my life. Um, and thankfully, it led me to, to where I am today you know, with an executive uh, leadership position at NASA uh, doing what I love. Wow. So you're goals to be an aerospace engineer, to be a rocket scientist, it goes all the way back to third grade or even sooner? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was first inspired uh, when I watched the, you know, the Challenger accident. Um, and I, and I you know, was so enamored uh, with, with what happened, the decisions that were made, uh, the technology behind it. And I wanted to figure out you know, what I could do to have a career for a, a safe human space life. Wow. And so being in the Air Force was uh, your goal as well throughout uh, that entire time and you're all set to go to the air force and literally the day before you go to the air force they call you and they say hey you you can't come out yeah it was a little surreal you know because i mean i had everything you know ready to go and uh, i had no plans afterwards right because your life is then in control of the government right and so right 
uh, everything was set and I, yeah, very last minute. Wow. And I guess, uh, at least from the, from the, uh, standpoint of Cutco here, a blessing in disguise was that that ended up leading you to, um, to sell Cutco, right? Yeah. I mean, it is it, definitely a direct result of what happened, uh, you know, right after high school. You know, it's interesting to me in that I wasn't really lost, right? I mean, I knew where I was and I knew where I wanted to be. Um, I just needed to pick a new route to get there uh, because college was now starting in a couple of months and I needed to apply to go to other places, you know, and trust me, college applications are not something you want to start after graduation. Uh, right. But because now, now it was too late for any type of financial aid, I was, I was pretty limited. You know, luckily I was able to plead my case with Purdue Calumet, um, which is in Northwest Indiana. Um, they said they can enroll me in classes that weren't uh, filled to capacity yet, uh, but again, I couldn't get any financial aid for my first year. And so now, um, look, I mean, Purdue is still a great value for college, especially with its reputation for engineering and, and aerospace engineering. I mean, it's the, as we were talking earlier, it's, it's both the cradle of astronauts and quarterbacks. I mean, it had Neil Armstrong and Drew Brees. Of course, uh, back then, college was very different in terms of cost. Um, you know, I remember it was $1,500 for 15 credit hours. And that I was going to live at home, so it was still, um, you know, within the, the realm of possibility. Uh, I wanted to sign up for 20 hours my first semester, and I needed money fast. And, you know, $2,000 to save in a couple of months is still a big ask for a teenager living in, in Hammond. And, um, you know, that's when I kept seeing those peculiar signs on the light post. You know, uh, maybe back then it was something like, you know, college students, thirteen twenty-five an hour. And then there was a phone <laughs> number, right? It was like the mystery. What is this? You know, you have no idea what, what, what the job really is. Um, you know, even when I called, it, it was something about sporting goods, right? And, uh, you know, the interview, <laughs> the, the interview is nothing, you know, like I expected from the phone call. Uh, of course, uh, you know, that interview was the opportunity to sell Cutco. Um, as, as you mentioned, that's when I met uh, Mike Muriel, who was the, the branch manager. Um, and I also met Tanya, who, who I think was the assistant manager, um, who was only a couple years older than me. Uh, she was a student at Purdue Lafayette, and that's where I wanted to be. And so, um, you know, since that's what I wanted, I was sort of all in on, on selling knives that summer and joining the team. Nice. That is pretty cool. Um, hey, you mentioned Neil Armstrong. You know, we have been, there's been this like legend in the Cutco business for many years that Neil Armstrong sold Cutco. It was supposedly after he he had already gone to like, the, the I think he went to the Korean War right away when he was like 18 or 19. And he, then he came back, then he went to Purdue and it was while he was at Purdue to help pay his way through school in the 1950s somewhere. Do, do you, can you corroborate this at all? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot, right? Uh, I'm not really sure the early years. Uh, you know, I've, I've read some books and, and watched you know, some of the documentaries, but uh, I certainly don't know if he had a side hustle, but I'll say it wouldn't surprise me because of you know, just uh, his personality mentality that he could take on anything and take on the world and, and be successful. And I think, you know, as you know, you know, selling knives is all about that personal, uh, you know, initiative and, and getting out there. And so it, it definitely sounds like something that, that Neil would not only do, but, but succeed, uh, succeed at accomplishing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what were some of your experiences that uh, really stand out from your time with the company? Yeah. So, you know, in hindsight, there's, there's probably several times I wish I could go back and pick myself a little for sure. Uh, things I could have done better. You know, I have to say, I really enjoyed the sales part of the job. You know, I think like most people, I, I started off dreading the phone call to set the appointment. Uh, but once I had an appointment, I knew that sale or no sale, uh, both the customer and I were going to have a good time uh, because, you know, kind of like this, you know, I, I love telling stories and I love telling stories while I was selling knives. And so uh, my appointments uh, averaged over 90 minutes, which I think is longer than normal. Um, but I, I know I also had a really high average order, something like $350 per sale. Um, you know, I also remember my, my sister being really supportive. Um, she was one of my first customers who, who bought a galley set for me. And, and she lived at home. She kept it in a box. She didn't really have the money, you know, for the purchase or the need at the time. But I really don't even know why she bought it. Um, but I'll, I'll say today she has a Homemaker Plus 8. Uh, and so that's great. Um, you know, in general, and, and I don't know if it's because you only get leads for, for, you know, the nice people. Maybe, you know, you send, you know, some kid, you know, out to meet your nicer friends, right? But, uh, you know, I think even without sales, over 95% of my appointments were with friendly people that wanted to see me succeed. And I walked away almost with a new friend, uh, you know, each appointment that I had. Um, 
my uh, my my second year, I was an assistant branch manager, and so I have lots of memories from that experience. You know, I moved to St. Louis and, and helped open up an, a new office in Bellevue, Illinois. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the home of the giant ketchup bottle, which I was uh, everyone local wanted to show me. And uh, you know, it was my my first job where my success was really dependent on the success of those I served. You know, and it's a very different role, mental, you know, um, with a different mentality. You know, you're more of a mentor. Uh, I also remember a time when an older person came in for an interview and, and she sort of judged me, you know, as a, as a young teenager and, and commented that she didn't think I wore the shoes of a successful person. And that made me a little self-conscious for a little while. You know, I didn't have expensive clothes, a watch, or, you know, obviously expensive shoes, you know, but I, w- I wasn't budgeting for Alan Edmonds at the time, right? I was budgeting for school. Um, you know, I probably let that bother me a little more than I should, but, but some things you learn later in life. Uh, there's a lot of things that I still learn, you know, every day. Um, you know, what I guess what I'd say, the, um, the experience that stands out the most were, were the people that I got to know that second summer. You know, if you really want exposure to diversity, you know, offer a high paying job with no skills required and see who comes through the door. You know, hmm. uh, you know my experience taught me um, also that you really can't predict who will do well in a position that is almost entirely dependent on effort versus any other criteria. Um, yeah, you know, the first leads might be great if you're from an affluent family, but that they really didn't matter after the first week. You know, some people who you thought were going to follow the process and have great results, you know, would quit the first week. You know, I, I think some people quit before they even told their parents that they accepted the job and received their kit. Um, you know, while, while others were, were really quiet and you might have concerns with their communication skills, but they simply learned to follow the script and, and the script worked. And, uh, you know, I wish there was a way to sort of take that mentality, you know, the fear that's irrational, that to just have faith in the process and then you'll get results and your results just require you to, to step through that process and make the effort. And I really wish I could instill that into people. And, you know, we see that frequently, right? The ability to instill, you know, into others, you know, to sort of buy into a proven process is what makes great coaches and great leaders. And mm-hmm. uh, that's also what makes, you know, I'm assuming great managers uh, at Cutco. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, Mike Muriel is just known as somebody who's great at instilling confidence into others. I mean, he himself is a very confident person. And I think I think just his his uh, personal example on a lot of the things that he says um, helps instill that confidence in others. And it's one of the great traits, I think, of a lot of great leaders and something that we get a chance to practice. Right. I, just like you, John, I was an assistant manager my second summer and I, you know, I was 17 when I started the job. So I was 18 my second summer working as an assistant manager, interviewing people sometimes older than me. Um, one time somebody who babysat me when I was a kid came in for the interview. Um, right. so that was really funny. Um, and, um, and you know, I had a chance to practice as an 18 year old investing myself into helping others to grow and develop. And there's just something so great about that as a young person that uh, was really a trans- transformative experience for me uh, during my, my early days with Cutco. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the highlights that, that I get to enjoy now in my, my current role. Yeah. What, what are the key lessons you feel like you've carried with you into what you're doing now? Yeah, well, you know, every job is basically a sales position. Um, you know, I have customers, you know, just the same. If I have a customer that, that I believe should make an investment in a new technology because it will help them, you know, I need to understand how to show them the value that's there. You know, that's certainly a lesson from Cutco is that value is what matters. Uh, price is secondary. You know, obviously, it's still relevant, but it's all about the value and the performance you can get. You know, um, another related lesson is certainly that you have to really show the, um, the long-term potential of decisions to spend money. You, know, you can buy cheaper knives than Cutco, uh, but you need to replace them or you'll have a poor product, a more dangerous product. And sometimes that costs you more in the long run. And so it's the same, you know, so if now I, I want to sell a digital transformation investment, let's say for earth science or storm tracking data processing, you know, we could be spending $300,000 per year to do it, you know, and do it slow and efficiently with greater errors. Um, or we can make an investment in a million dollars for a machine learning software development and bring that cost down to 50000 per year. We get better accuracy and it pays for itself. Yet customers may not want to spend more upfront. You know, you need to um, create that understanding of how this is really better for the long run. Um, you know, probably a more relatable analogy is my mom and her grill. You know, she would buy these cheap grills for maybe $150. And, and I remember trying to convince her to buy a $500 Duquesne grill, which is like a, uh, the value version of a Weber. 
it's got better materials, better construction, and it cooks better, right? And and 20 years later, I'm still using my my Duquesne while my mom has replaced her grill so many times, <laughs> right? From, from the rust you get, you know, in the Midwest, um, you know, every few years. And so, you know, I paid less in the long run. I had a better experience the whole time. And so, you know, that's certainly a lesson that that you learn well from Cutco that, again, it applies really to every job. Um, another, another thing I'll say is, I, you know, I'm amazed with, with how many people, even professional engineers at NASA, are afraid to pick up the phone, you know, and just, just call somebody sometimes with a question uh, to find out what someone needs to ask for help or, or to collaborate on a project. You know, it's, it's some irrational fear. And I see it actually getting worse now with, with the texting and everybody else that people don't like to talk to one another as much. Um, you know, selling Cutco, you know, we were taught to think of the phone like an ATM machine, right? You punch in the numbers and money just comes out. Uh, and, you know, so many times in my career, I've experienced the same thing. You know, it sounds silly, but, you know, I would call a customer, you know, that others were afraid to call, and they would tell me exactly what they need or validate requirements or expectations. And then because of that, I was able to give them exactly what they needed, you know, where others uh, simply couldn't because they were afraid to ask, you know, and they were guessing sometimes. You know, I, even one time um, I was running a NASA Shark Tank event in order to get people excited about submitting new technologies and new ideas. And so I, you know, I contacted Mark Cuban and I asked him if he would be a judge, you know, and, and my leadership was like, you did what? <laughs> you know? And, and uh, but Mark said, yes, you know, and, and from the event, you know, NASA received several new ideas that result in patents and, and technologies licensed to industry and in solving challenges on earth, right? Um, all because, you know, I didn't hesitate to pick up the phone, right? And so um, that's something that is a lesson that, you know, it's hard to learn, and Cutco sort of forces you to get over that fear. Um, uh, fundamentally, I'd say that, you know, you know even at NASA, 95% of all of our challenges that we have are, are communication. It's not really with technology. And so, you know, it's true that I'm blessed to work with brilliant engineers and scientists, even procurement officials, lawyers, and the housekeeping team. You know, it's all the same. Uh, if you actually listen to what your customer wants and needs, and then they can go back and, and communicate and validate clear expectations, uh, then you can be successful. And that applies really to, to every career. And again, you know, that's sort of ingrained in you when, you, when you're selling Cutco and working for uh, Vector Marketing. Wow. That was amazing, John. I mean, just a great testament to the value of what uh, uh, we do here at Cutco in terms of helping young people prepare for greater success in life. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. That was really, really valuable. Um, tell us a little bit about your time at Purdue and, uh, and, and, and you know, specifically uh, how, how your, the early part of your career uh, kind of evolved from that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I love Purdue. You know, I believe black and gold. Uh, we were talking about sports. It's going to be a, a great season for us, uh, especially in basketball. You know, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, I always knew I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. Uh, so after I transferred down to Lafayette, uh, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't the best student. I probably played a little too much basketball. Um, I also worked night shift in the dorm as a, as a door checker and continued doing that as a, as a dorm counselor. And, and I worked a lot alone, um, which was challenging for some assignments. Uh, as a counselor, I was really competitive, um, always having to win every floor contest. And, you know, I, I enjoyed getting to know so many people from different backgrounds, different goals, and so many students that were just needing help. And, you know, I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in the physics and aerospace engineering because um, I was interested in advanced propulsion. And then my master's in aerospace engineering. I also had the opportunity to, to teach. Um, so I taught physics for education majors while I was in grad school. And I, and I really enjoyed that teaching, again, kind of like that assistant manager job, you know, where you're trying to, um, you know, help others, you know, really understand and appreciate the nuances that you need to be successful. And so, you know, I knew that's something that I wanted to do um, in the future, you know, that, that uh, mentoring role or the teaching role. Uh, overall, I'm just grateful that Purdue really prepared me though for the real world, you know, um, most students are like, um, am I really going to use this ever in my life? You know, like I'm sure, uh, you know, most people when they graduate high school never use geometry again or some of the advanced algebra. Um, but I was actually using partial differential equations, MATLAB simulations, you know, even deriving equations from basic laws of physics. Uh, the first week on the job, I remember I needed to calculate adiabatic flame temperature, you know, not for homework, but for, for work. And, uh, you know, I was one of the few people that knew exactly you know, how to do that fresh out of school. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, it, it really prepared me for the future. And it was, it was a great choice to end up at Purdue. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And, and so how did your career begin after you got out of Purdue? 
Yeah, so the um, the first part was was getting a career, uh, you know, trying to get a job. You know, even after I graduated, um, you know, people think that, you know, oh, you're the chief technologist. It was probably easy. Everybody was throwing offers your way, right? But that's, you know, even with um, my master's degree from a prestigious university, I, I actually had a challenge finding a job. You know, it wasn't the best time, you know, when I graduated. Um, but I refused to move home because I, 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 you know, somehow I thought it wouldn't keep me motivated to find a job. And it's like accepting defeat. So I, I moved in with a, with a girlfriend and her friend in, in Indianapolis. And I would uh, constantly apply for jobs and, and teach at the middle schools and high schools as both a, a daily and long-term substitute teacher. And, uh, and each day I would go through the internet scouring for, for jobs and I would tailor a cover page for each opportunity and then apply. Uh, the goal was no less than than 30 applications a day, and I, and I did this for months. Um, and I, you know, I almost thought, you know, my window might close, but then I actually ended up getting uh, two interviews the same week, um, and got offers from both places. You know, once I got the interviews, and so um, you know, I took my first job at a small business that was providing engineering services to NASA, so called Gray Research. It was uh, less than 100 people at the time, and uh, you know, I felt really welcome to the team. Uh, moved down to Alabama. And, uh, and the owner, Ron, you know, he was really as supportive as, as any employee uh, could ever want. Uh, you know, there I, I started supporting the NASA in-space propulsion technology program office. And uh, again, uh, while I was there, um, I also went to the labs and I asked if I could do some extra work, you know, in the evenings. And I was welcomed into the lab to do some design build tests of advanced electric propulsion engines, which was my dream job. Um, so at that time it was my, my side hustle. and. Uh, you know, at the time, it was actually even run by uh, by Tom Markusik, who um, who left SpaceX and is now the CEO of Firefly. Uh, you know, I'll, I will say that there's very little that's more satisfying than coming up with some new technology concept or reading a journal article and actually building it, and testing it, um, or test even using the new diagnostics and learning how it truly works, the sensitivity, design choices, fabrication challenges. You know, I, I learned early that engineers can design lots of things that can't be manufactured easily. Um, and then, uh, you know, after doing that for a while, you know, I found that I, I actually wasn't very successful at selling thrust, selling thrusters. You know, it wasn't as easy as selling knives. <laughs> so what, what I did was I, got, <laughs> I, I actually got more involved with systems analysis, you know, and then low thrust trajectory optimization, which is really for marketing my thrusters. So again, I, I harnessed my Cutco experience and I picked up the phone. And I cold called, you know, an engineer at JPL, uh, Carl Sauer, and I asked him to teach me you know, how to do trajectory optimization for these electric propulsion engines. And he did it without hesitating. You know, he showed me how to do everything. And you see, I was, I was characteriz characterizing my thrusters uh, based on their characteristics, which, um, you know, doesn't really matter to those who want to buy the thrusters. You know, a person buying a knife doesn't really care if it's high carbon, right? They care if it stays sharp for a long time. And, and that's what trajectory optimization did for me. So instead of telling a planetary scientist, my thruster has a specific impulse of 4,000 seconds, which is like its fuel efficiency. Um, instead, I could tell a scientist, look, my thruster can get your science instrument to your target a year faster and with a lower cost space path. Um, so trajectory optimization allowed me to communicate the value of the technology to the decision maker. And, and that's when I started to have real success. You know, from there, I, I moved to Cleveland to support NASA Glenn. Um, who works on advanced propulsion systems that also want to be able to sell some of their technologies. Uh, I even started my own small business um, because you know, outside of JPL, there are very few people who are doing uh, low thrust optimization. And this was before computers and new algorithms made the problems relatively easy. So um, you know, business was good at the time. And then uh, NASA Marshall offered me an opportunity for a government position uh, to help pursue technology investments directly for NASA and sort of guide the agency a little bit more. And again, uh, you know, the model of understanding your customers' needs, turning that into hardware solutions and new projects was, was successful for me. And, and that's when I transitioned to be the chief technologist at Marshall. So that, that allows me to help foster this culture of innovation, uh, mentor talented engineers on how to successfully identify pain points to the, the customers, and then come up with innovative solutions and get the funding to, to develop those technologies, whether that's new thrusters, new battery technologies, materials, manufacturing techniques, or even you know, advanced life support systems for, for like the space station. Uh, most recently, I started teaching an evening class through Arizona State University. It's called the uh, L Space Academy, uh, which is a partnership with NASA that teaches skills relevant to future STEM workforce. 
And so uh, I focus on teaching, how, again, how to identify those technology needs and how to write proposals, right? How to communicate you know, the value to, to the customers. And I absolutely love it. You know, I enjoy working with the class. The students are just amazing. And it's a, it's a real family atmosphere um, where you know, we all want to help each other succeed. And it, this might surprise you, but you know, so many people you know, that are outstanding in, in science and technology and math, you know, those students, they, they really need a support system to help build that confidence. Kind of like that Mike Muriel, right? You need that somebody sitting on your shoulder saying, you can do this, right? Um, which, is, which is really interesting because, you know, the class is mostly students that are busting their butts, they're working late hours on something that isn't even required, and yet they seem to question themselves, right? They question, you know, do I really belong here? And they seem surprised when they're successful. And, uh, you know, it started with just a couple dozen students, and now you know, I'm fortunate to have hundreds of students every semester, and it's, uh, it's energizing for me. And as a virtual class, I get to meet so many students from Puerto Rico to Hawaii and Alaska everywhere in between it's hundreds of colleges and universities and it's yielded so many new innovations for NASA and it's again it's, it's really energizing for, for what I do every day. Wow that was cool to hear uh, how your career has progressed um, and you started out as a substitute teacher looking for work in the aerospace engineering field um, and then you know had uh, had a couple breakthroughs that led you to where you are now that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. Again, I, you know, I had you know, friends and family to, to support me along the way and just um, you know, allow me to, to keep, you know, keep trying you know, before uh, I finally broke through. Yeah. So now you're the head rocket scientist for all of NASA. What, uh, what does this mean you're responsible for? Yeah. So uh, you, know, you make my job sound uh, maybe a little cooler than it probably is. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the capability lead for in-space transportation for the agency. And that's primarily propulsion, uh, but it's also the ancillary systems required to support transportation needs. So, for example, if we want a megawatt class electric propulsion system, um, that to, we also need to have higher temperature radiators before the system is viable. Uh, we need to develop new materials and manufacturing processes. And so I look at the system and, and look at what we need to have that transportation capability available for the agency when we need it to meet its requirements. Um, in, in terms of my responsibilities, you know, as the as the chief technologist at Marshall, you know, I serve about 5,000 people, um, which includes uh, both civil servants and the contractor team. Uh, as the capability lead, it's a portfolio that serves about 2,000 people across most of the NASA centers, and it's about a $2 billion uh, portfolio and in investment. Uh, I, I provide that strategic guidance on the investments, and I also coordinate with the other agencies like the Air Force and the Space Force, uh, industry and academia. Uh, to make sure that our work is, uh, is aligned and we're all um, you know, sort of uh, swimming in the same direction to achieve our common goals. And so what are, what, are, what are some of the primary goals that you're focused on in the, in, in the near term? Yeah, so our near-term goals have been um, focusing on in-space transportation for, for Mars. You know, that's, that's really our, our long tent pole in order to, uh, to get our way to Mars. And so on the NASA side, you know, we've been focusing a lot on uh, nuclear propulsion solutions. So that's nuclear thermal, but also nuclear electric propulsion. Uh, and also some of the uh, support systems that you might need for, for different solutions, such as uh, cryogenic fluid management. Um, so if, if Starship, for example, uses cryogenic propellants with liquid methane, liquid oxygen. And then we have uh, solutions um, like Blue Origin uses liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and all those require you know, the valves and the actuators and, and you don't want to lose uh, too much of your cryogenic commodities during boil off. And so managing those fluids is a real challenge for us. And so we're developing all the fundamental technologies we need to enable that. So what, what's the outlook for being able to land on Mars? Yeah, so I mean, everything is, seems to be uh, heading in a positive direction. So I'm certainly excited for, uh, for what's coming. Of course, uh, you know, the moon is coming up first. Uh, so we'll be getting there. Is there, there's plans to go back to the moon in the next couple of years, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I say that, you know, since the dates are much closer, the plans for returning the moon are, are much higher fidelity. You know, be, before the Trump administration, I believe we were hoping to, to return to the moon by 2028. Uh, during that administration, there were significant initiatives to pull that date forward, um, originally targeting 2024 to land the first woman and another astronaut on the south pole of the moon. Um, so we should be seeing uh, the Space Launch System and Orion launching in the spring of 22, 
And then the human landing system, uh, that contract was awarded to SpaceX and it's, it's trending towards a 25 landing, um, which is the first woman, the first person of color on the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, the goal is to, to lay the infrastructure for sustainable presence, and, uh, and that includes at least uh, 10 moon landings in the near future. So, you know, um, I'll say a, a large focus of these lunar activities, though, is testing the technologies that are going to be used for missions to Mars. Uh, the current NASA plan does have the crew on the surface of Mars in the late 2030s, and SpaceX, you know, they have their own plans uh, to send people to Mars even sooner. And how will such space travel change lives for normal people? Yeah, so uh, I can say this is probably for multiple series of podcasts uh, to answer that question. Uh, and I think they exist, actually. But, um, you know, I, I hope that every person appreciates just how pervasive space has been to every person's life. Uh, some of those are, are military space investments, such as GPS that we use every day when we're you know, mapping our directions to go somewhere, um, tracking where our phone might be. You know, many are NASA, such as the cameras in our phones and in our pockets. Um, you know, those were developed as a lightweight camera for planetary science. Uh, certainly, Earth science has a major influence in our, in our lives. Um, with the platform we get from space, you know, it influences our future energy sources um, when we need to seek shelter from hurricanes, uh, you know, that we forecast, uh, predicting crop yields, disaster relief, you know, even improvements to municipal water supplies. And so it really is everywhere, you know. Um, now, I really believe when, when you send humans specifically out into space, they need technologies to efficiently support both the frailty of people and develop the tools for them to maintain high productivity. And you know, so necessity becomes their mother of invention. This could include telerobotics for remote medical procedures, long-term storage of medications, water recovery, recycling, uh, even mental health monitoring you know, and intervention due to isolation uh, is something that you know, would have and, and will be a benefit to so many people that went into isolation during COVID, for example. You know, the, the list is really endless. It's interesting to think about what you just said that, uh, you know, many, many, many sort of medical innovations that are needed here on Earth uh, can be developed during our time in space. As you said, necessity is the mother of invention. When people are out there, it's a, it's a difficult environment to keep somebody alive in, right? And so, uh, it, it does yield a lot of, of, uh, of technologies and benefits that could be uh, applied here. Absolutely. I mean, everything from, you know, clean water, you know, clean air, um, you know, the medical procedures, all of these things, you know, are, you know, sort of pushed to the extreme when we try to get these closed systems that are you know, sustainable uh, for long durations. And all of those things apply back to Earth. Yeah, interesting. Um, you mentioned SpaceX, John. What is the differences between NASA and a private sector enterprise like SpaceX? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I want to say is that you know, we're partners, we're not competitors. Uh, NASA has always worked with industry suppliers to help NASA accomplish its goals. You know, the best case scenario for us is that we don't need to develop it, that it exists and we could just buy it from someone else. You know, the space shuttle may have been designed by NASA, but it was built by a team from APK, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing Rockwell. You know, we're certainly using a different procurement process now, where instead of paying for a shuttle for a NASA design, we're paying for SpaceX uh, for that service of sending astronauts to the space station, and more recently to develop a human lander. You know, so NASA is still involved in the certification of the, of the commercial crew system. Uh, you know, we help sort of mentor the SpaceX and bring them along, um, but they have tremendous freedom in their design choices. You know, with, within NASA, I would say there are pockets of NASA that are just like, like SpaceX. You know, but, but there's also investments that are very different. And a lot of it is really based on our tolerance of failure. You know, there are investments in NASA that really function under that model of failure is not an option. Uh, but th those systems sometimes have longer development cycles and significant uh, traceability to heritage solutions, you know, proving that we haven't changed much since the last time. Um, and we wanna understand the fundamentals, you know, regarding how each material behaves under the different environments. And when there are changes from previous experience in operations or environments, we, we study it a lot, um, often from first principles in an attempt to characterize that risk. Um, but there's other programs, you know, especially ones with limited heritage, where the goal is to fail fast and fail smart, um, and to learn from each failure and iterate quickly. You know, these are sometimes not as visible at NASA as they may be with SpaceX with things like the Starship, you know, they had an impressive number of iterations due to failures, but, but they learned at a fast pace, and this is, this is wonderful. Uh, sometimes at NASA, you know, there may be a concern, whether it's real or perceived, that if NASA has a failure, it's not a learning experience on the right path, but rather it's a true failure. And we have to stop and, and answer to Congress about how and why we failed 
perform detailed failure analysis for months and, and answer questions to the American taxpayer about why they paid for a failure before we can restart the program and apply lessons learned. And so, you know, that, that environment in communicating expectations is, is very different. Um, but at the same time, I'm excited to see what, what SpaceX has been able to do. I mean, anybody who watched, you know, the, the flyback boosters landing, you know, I mean, it's just a you know, wonderful sight to see if you love rocket propulsion. It's just so amazing. Um, at the same time, you know, the first time, you know, they, they landed uh, one on the barge, right, immediately, you know, it cut the feed and we didn't see what happened, right, because it had exploded when it landed. Um, you know, as a, as a government you know, provider, you know, we certainly can't cut the feed um, and let people not see the failure sometimes or, or, or cover things up. But, um, you know, it's an exciting time overall um, to see what we're doing. And, and I think this partnership has definitely yielded tremendous dividends, right? We have an American company launching, you know, astronauts from American soil, and they're doing it, you know, in a much more affordable fashion. And that frees up resources to allow us to do the more challenging activities. That, that's cool to hear that, uh, you, you know, NASA and SpaceX are uh, viewed as partners, not competitors, that there's a lot of collaboration that happens. And, and uh, I like what you said about the goal uh, is to fail fast and fail smart as you're evolving in technology. Um, and and it, it seems like there's a balance between, you know, having all the answers and being the expert, but also being willing to learn and eager to learn and eager to develop all the time. Um, one of my avid listeners, John, uh, suggested that I ask you about the balance between um, being a beginner, keeping yourself in what she called beginnership, um, and um, also being an expert in your field and having to feel like you've got to stay on top. Um, how do you balance those elements of your job and, and your and, and you know how you're trying to continue learning and and uh, and developing? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, I'll say in, in some ways it's sort of forced upon you in that so much is new. Um, the position of a chief technologist is very humbling. It certainly has been for me, you know, because I had to accept that I cannot know everything for every technology. Right? Um, it, it's just not possible. Uh, it's even more challenging today than 10 years ago because of both the pace of innovation and the number of organizations involved in space entrepreneurship. So, uh, you know, thankfully, I have a great team to reach back on nearly any discipline. Uh, as the capability lead, I can focus more effort on um, for greater depth on fewer technologies. Uh, even though the fundamental principles are the same, the manufacturing process and materials are still frequently changing on them. Uh, the tools that we have for analysis and evaluations are also continuously evolving. And so, you know, I'm always in the lab with the engineers working, uh, sometimes getting a little time I get to play myself. Uh, you know, I try to read, uh, you know, the journal articles and stay up to date. I get to work with industry partners. Uh, I study the, the, the tech trends and, and I also get invited uh, to serve on hundreds of review boards, uh, portfolio assessments inside and outside of NASA, um, and even the competitions that allows me to um, have that opportunity to see the latest technologies and, and what's going on throughout the community. And that, that certainly helps me. Uh, try to stay on top of what's going on. That sounds great. It, it, uh, it, it definitely, I feel like that that's a key, has to be a key part of the kind of job that you have because things are changing so fast all the time and, and always evolving. And so you always have to be, you, you have to be constantly evolving at the same rate or greater rate as, uh, as the technologies. So, um, what, uh, a lot of people wanted me to ask you about, Life outside of Earth, John. What's your uh, What's your view on the the existence of intelligent life uh, outside of our our Earth here? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I get asked that question a lot. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'll say you know the rational side of me. You know, I, I look at what's called the Drake equation. So that's the equation that states that there's a there's a certain um, rate for star formation. A fraction of those stars will have planets, and a fraction of those planets will develop life, and a fraction of, of the, that life will develop into intelligent life. Um, and then we recognize that that intelligent life will only have a limited amount of time to communicate with us before the civilization will collapse. Uh, so, you know, during my life, I have seen us start to bound those coefficients. You know, the, the, the Kepler mission, you know, certainly helped us understand that planets around stars are very common. Uh, NASA just announced the astrophysics priority. Um, which has developed the uh, LUVOR telescope, uh, which can 
uh, investigate potentially habitable planets. And so we're going to get those coefficients of, of which those planets can support life. So, you know, I am almost certain that life exists in the universe. And what I don't know is if that life is intelligent life that will become capable of space travel or even space communication. You know, the Earth has been around for four and a half billion years, and yet humans, you know, have only been around for a very small fraction of that time. Um, there are multiple statistical anomalies that are believed to have occurred with well-timed ice ages and volcanic eruptions that have resulted in our larger brain formation, the ability to cooperate, and, and then we began writing only about 5,000 years ago. And so modern intelligent life might be extremely rare. It could even be unique. Um, you know, the Drake equation in history also, though, tells me, you know, that we should take action to become an interplanetary species, um, you know, so that we increase the time we have as a thriving civilization um, to communicate to others and, and also to protect our species. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just seems like with, I mean, I, I've obviously I have limited knowledge, but it just seems like with the billions and billions of stars that are out there that just like you said, some portion of them can support life, some portion of those will evolve life, some portion of those will evolve intelligent life. And so it just seems like there has to be other intelligent life out there. The difficulty, as you stated, is that then you have to be able to learn how to um, communicate outside of your your own uh, solar system, your own planet. You have to be, be able to learn to travel outside of it eventually. And that, that's something that we're barely able to do um, in, in a limited way, right? And so the likelihood of other um, intelligent species being able to communicate with us or travel here might be, it might be zero, um, it might be very, very low. Um, but, the, but the idea that there's something out there to certainly uh, seems like it, it uh, it would be it would be a, a very high likelihood of being true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, this is a fun, you know, fireside philosophical chat, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting when I talk to other scientists and they say, well, you know, statistics tell you that there's lots, but at the same time, you know, look at the odds of what what did happen. You know, so you know, the Earth is a planet around the sun, so there's a percentage of those, and it's in this what we call the Goldilocks zone, right, where it's not too right. close, so it's not too hot. You know, it was bombarded by comets at the right time in order to provide all this water that we have on the planet. Um, it had a collision um, with an object, you know, the size of Mars, which created the moon and the tilt, which led the seasons. And the seasons helped create um, life in order to have them, uh, you know, leave, leave the oceans, right, and go on the land. And then there was, you know, a well-timed, like a volcanic eruption that forced, you know, the uh, uh, the primates to leave the trees and start walking, you know. And so again, when you think about all the statistical, you know, things that had to occur, you know, again, it's hard to know, you know, just how unlikely is it that this would all happen again, you know, somewhere else. Yeah. Yep. Uh, definitely a interesting philosophical philosophical discussion. Well, what you, I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, humans becoming interplanetary as a species. What would be a chain of events that could make that a realistic possibility in the future? Yeah, so you know, this is probably the, the question that people have the most fun posing to Elon Musk, right? Who has you know, single-handedly has the resources to, and in some ways already has catalyzed our path to becoming an interplanetary species. So you know, wh whether you watch the TV show, The Expanse, or, or just follow SpaceX, you, know, you quickly realize that the key to sustain is sustainable transportation. And so it's exciting time for me uh, because that's you know, sort of the focus of my world, right? Um, you know, I don't know yet the, the marginal cost of launching Starship or the efficacy of hydrogen-based propulsion systems uh, for things such as nuclear thermal propulsion. You know, we have the, the long-term prospects appear really good for in situ fuel production on the moon and especially for methane on Mars. And so first is, is a viable, and that's really a cost viable propulsion solution. Uh, but again, you know, that could be my bias because that's the world I see. Um, you know, next, we really need to understand the human risk of the long duration exposure to deep space radiation. Um, you know, we have humans that have been working now continuously in space for more than 20 years on the International Space Station, uh, but that's protected by the Earth's magnetic field. And so we may require radiation mitigation technology, or hopefully we can, we can rely largely on just intelligent design, such as you know, storing our water strategically located, or, or when we get there, piling up regoliths to provide some radiation protection. Uh, we're definitely going to need reliable power production, 
uh, which I believe is relatively trivial with, uh, with nuclear fission reactors. Uh, but if we have ample power, uh, then I believe we will have reliable sources of oxygen pulled from the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, you know, it was recently demonstrated with MOXIE on the Mars Perseverance rover, um, but we need to scale that up significantly from where it is now as a proof of concept. Uh, another exciting area, especially one we work on a lot here at Marshall, is, um, is, is we're going to need, you know, in space and on surface manufacturing, you know, eventually from local material feedstocks. So, you know, think about the 3D printers for parts that break and, and tools that we need. You know, and this also aligns with surface excavation and construction. So those technologies are absolutely critical for, for sustainable supply chains. Um, then probably will come food production capabilities to become increasingly independent from the earth. And so, um, you know, I also imagine that we're going to become highly dependent on autonomous systems, especially, you know, smart sensors and equipment and environmental monitoring with machine learning to predict potential near-term failures of systems for that proactive maintenance and repair. I mean, you don't want your life support system to fail uh, when, you know, just before you decide to fix it, right? <laughs> you want to start working on it before the life support fails, otherwise the clock is ticking. And so, um, you know, I think um, you know, there's quite a bit. Uh, certainly, um, what I'm hoping for is, is some event that's going to be a discovery or some new production capability, such as mining asteroids, that offers an economic incentive for a private investment. Um, which will then lead to an economically sustainable civilization beyond Earth. You know, space exploration is no longer limited to only large nation states, um, but as we've seen, private investors and even individuals um, with, with their own you know, priorities and, and interests in, in moving us beyond the Earth. You said we need economic incentives for, for this to occur, for all of this to occur. What, what would be a, a couple examples of that? Yeah, so you know, I'm not sure what we'll discover on Mars, but I, I think you know there's lots of literature out there with the resources that are available in the asteroids, and so the asteroids can include raw materials such as you know nickel and platinum and things like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, near term, it's going to be um, water is going to be the most important commodity because it could be broken down for space propulsion or it could be broken down for oxygen, the things that we need to sustain those environments. And so I think there will be commodities that will start to gain value. And so we just have to figure out when that threshold you know, crossover occurs where, you know, private investment will, will try to capitalize on, on providing those commodities and obtaining those resources. And, you know, when they do, you know, then we start to see that real you know, expansion and, and push out because it's no longer contingent on, you know, election cycles or anything else um, in order to maintain progress and keep growing, you know, that civilization once, once it's put there on the surface of Mars. Yeah. And what do you feel would be the most realistic, the most optimistic timeline for all this? Is this something we might see in our lifetimes? So, you know, it's funny you say that, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out what gets me excited about the future, right? Um, you know, in general terms, you know, as far as I can remember, you know, humans on Mars have always been 20 years away. Uh, but for the first time, I will say, I honestly believe that, that we will have humans on Mars in less than 20 years. Um, and to do so, you know, um, we're going to have unprecedented low-cost access to space, and that's what gets me excited, um, because simply that access opportunity is what enables acceleration with our innovation. Um, you know, we're starting to see that now with all the new startups, the space startups, and it's only getting better. The more people that fly to space and do more things with their space flights, it attracts even more people to do more activities in low Earth orbit and so on. And it reflects the, the growing market that, that NASA hoped to accomplish when we started doing the commercial crew program. Now, you know, don't be fooled, right? The space startups aren't doing it because it's cool or the hobby of the wealthy, right? It, they're doing it because they believe it's going to be a benefit to humanity, and specifically one that people are willing to pay for to receive that benefit. You know, whether that's cheaper internet, uh, cell phone communications, uh, space-based solar power, um, new materials, new, new medications that can only be produced in microgravity. Um, better extreme uh, weather tracking preparedness, uh, agriculture, land management, right, and so on. And so the more space becomes accessible, the larger the benefits will be for all humanity. And so it's an exciting time for in-space transportation and an exciting time for space exploration overall. Wow. I mean, that was really enlightening just to hear some of the things that you shared that could be some of the evolutions that uh, can occur because of space travel and uh it really has given me a whole new perspective on on what you do and on uh you know the the whole role of nasa and and uh and uh you know what we're 
what we're trying to develop and create. So it's pretty cool. Is Thank there, you. yeah, is there anything else you wish people knew about uh, about NASA that you'd want to share? Um, you know, I mean, you know, in the near term, I, I certainly always like to give plugs for things that are happening, uh, which is, uh, you know, James Webb Space Telescope, right? That's been, you know, uh, we've been waiting a long time for that. It's going to be the next great observatory, vastly superior to Hubble. Um, it's essentially, it's like a time machine, right? It can look back billions of years to the early universe. And uh, that's been shipped. That's going to be launching, you know, in a month. Um, NASA completed the stacking of the Artemis One system. And so in a few months, the, the Space Launch System and Orion is going to be launching a follow Artemis II with crew. And that's going to go around the moon and then Artemis III landing on the moon. And all this is, is paving the way for a long-term lunar presence. And that's going to serve as a stepping stone on the way to Mars. And so, um, you know, we like to call it, you know, the Artemis generation, like the Apollo generation. And I, I think what I, what I want, you know, as many people as possible to appreciate, especially, you know, the, the younger kids, is, you know, this is, you know, an exciting place to be. And, you know, the, the science technology has made your contributions to society. And we need more scientists and engineers to get engaged, um, you know, overall in all industries, but especially aerospace industry. And, um, you know, there's, there's great careers here uh, for everybody. Everybody's welcome. It's a very inclusive environment. And um, I'm hoping Artemis is going to inspire more people to address, the, you know, the big gap we're going to have in our, in our needs. Yeah. Wow. Uh, cool stuff. Really, really, uh, interesting things that you've been sharing here, John, I really appreciate hearing all of your insights and all of your examples. It's, uh, it's been really a, a fun conversation. I've enjoyed this a lot. Um, I'd like to, uh, just, uh, give you a chance to wrap this up, um, and just share anything else that you feel like you're excited about, whether it's something, related to your job that uh, we haven't quite covered yet or anything, uh, anything personally that, uh, that you're excited about in your life? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I, I think I have expressed, you know, honestly, I'm just, I'm grateful for, for the opportunities that I have, you know, in the career I've gotten, you know, from pursuing you know, a STEM career. Um, you know, I'm excited that you know, every semester, again, I get hundreds of new students that are, that are excited to sort of continue some of the work that I've been doing. I'm excited to see the products that are coming um, that are going to, you know, influence and benefit you know, the, the lives of everybody. Um, you know, every year NASA puts out this this book. It's called, uh, you know, Spin Off, and uh, and it talks about some of the technologies that have been provided that, you know, significantly, you know, benefit everybody. And it's it's funny. It could be everything from, you know, odor eaters, you know, which is a problem on space station, but it's a problem for people on Earth. You know, it's uh, my uh, my father-in-law is a farmer and he's telling me how, how times have changed so much where he can use, you know, GPS data to know exactly, you know, where to apply fertilizer to get maximum yields and save money. And, and all of these things are going to be necessary as, you know, as, the, as we move forward and the population across the planet grows and we look about more, um, uh, you know, sustainable approaches to agriculture and everything that we do. So um, I, I'm truly blessed, you know, to, to work for NASA. Um, you know, I appreciate you having me, you know, here on the, on the podcast to share, you know, some of the work that we do because, um, you know, it gets me excited, you know, I'm, I'm you know, probably like you, uh, I'm blessed to, you know, wake up excited to go to work every day and not a lot of people can do that. And so, um, you know, I just love to, to share exactly what we're doing because, you know, believing in the mission, you know, is, is you know, what makes you, you know, want to keep doing that mission for long term. Yeah. Well, it seems like you have an awesome mission. Uh, in your life. And uh, that's really great. You've worked hard to be able to get there. Congratulations on all of your success. And it's, it's really cool to hear how what you're doing is changing lives. You know, like it, uh, it certainly fits in perfectly with the theme of this podcast. And it's been, as I said, really an enlightening conversation. I've been very grateful to have you as a guest here today on the podcast, John. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. All right, everyone. That was John Dankinich. Wow. What a unique guest this was and truly unique episode in the annals of this podcast. I thought it was really cool how John knew what he wanted to do when he was in third grade or even earlier than third grade um, and, and then has fulfilled that in his life. I mean, how many of us can say that uh, we're doing what we knew we wanted to be doing when we were in third grade. It just seems like John's entire life has been really driven by this mission 
um, and he's living that today, which is really cool. Um, I found it interesting how necessity is what uh, drove him into selling Cutco. Of course, he was planning on heading off to the Air Force, and then that wasn't able to happen, and he had to be able to pay for school. And what he learned is that sales is relevant in all of life. He said every job is a sales position. Um, and he described so many great examples of how demonstrating value is important, the long-term uh, potential of decisions that are made, uh, things like picking up the phone. Um, he said that, that, you know, that, that many of NASA's challenges are challenges of communication. And so all of the skills that one develops throughout the Cutco experience uh, can be so relevant um, in whatever it is that they do. Uh, that's something that we all know and believe, but it was really cool to hear it from somebody who is in such a unique field as rocket science. Um, to me, what was so enlightening about this conversation was how pervasive the work that John and people like him are doing has become in our lives. All of the things that we benefit from because of uh, space travel um, and that was really an interesting part of the conversation. And, uh, um, and, and it was inspiring to hear how the mission is being moved forward and what are the things that are next and the next moon landing, um, having a woman and a person of color on the moon that will help inspire legions of others, you know, what they could be a part of in the future, uh, going to Mars within 20 years, uh, as he stated. Um, so many neat things that, uh, that were shared here in this conversation. I hope you really enjoyed this one. I hope you'll share it with other people in your network. Um, I appreciate your support of the podcast, everyone, and I uh, hope you got great value out of this conversation with John Dankinich. Thanks.